September is Ovarian Cancer and Gynecologic Cancer Awareness Month. Today I want to talk about a rare gynecologic cancer that you may not know about, and that's fallopian tube cancer. If that sounds good to you, continue watching. Well, welcome. My name is Dr. DuPont. I'm a board-certified gynecologic oncologist, and I'm passionate about educating women and how to improve their lives, and I believe that begins with great health. Today we're going to talk about a rare cancer that you may not know about, and it's called fallopian tube cancer. Well, first, let's start with an anatomy lesson. The fallopian tube is very important. So it's this part, the fallopian tube, this part all the way to the uh, to the fimbria. This is called the fallopian tube. It's four to five inches long, and it's very important in terms of fertilization. This is actually where the egg and sperm meet. So if you're ovulating and an egg is here and there happens to be a sperm at the very same time, then you'll get pregnant. Usually that embryo will travel down to the uterus and implant, and then you get pregnant. If the egg gets here and there's no sperm present, then that egg will come to the uterus and that lining that's been preparing for pregnancy will slough off in that true menstrual cycle. And then that month you won't get pregnant. So the fallopian tube is very important. There are a lot of conditions can affect the fallopian tube and let's go over a few right now. So one is an ectopic or tubal pregnancy. And so that will happen if that egg and sperm meet and they fertilize, but it does not travel down to the uterus to implant. It actually implants in the fallopian tube. And as you can see, the fallopian tube is very small and it cannot handle a pregnancy. So that's called an ectopic or tubal pregnancy. And that is a surgical emergency. It's usually treated with surgery or chemotherapy, but it is life threatening. So certainly that can happen. Usually that tube or the fertilized egg gets stuck there because there's some damage to the fallopian tube. Other things that can happen to the fallopian tube would be something called like endometriosis can happen there and that's tissue in the uterus that's in the wrong location. It doesn't happen often in the fallopian tube, but it certainly can. You can get fibroids that are blocking the tube or pressing on the tube and, and those are usually benign masses. You can also get paratubal cysts. Those are benign cysts of the fallopian tube and usually we will see those on ultrasound or at the time of surgery. You can also get salpingitis or an inflammation or infection of the fallopian tube that's usually caused by chlamydia or gonorrhea. If left untreated, it can cause infertility. So that's a very important infection that can cause scarring in the fallopian tubes. And usually it's associated with pelvic inflammatory disease or PID if you've heard that term before. Other conditions of the fallopian tube is a stick tumor. So a serous intraepithelial tumor or intraepithelial carcinoma of, of the tube. We usually we say uh, it's a stick tumor and that's usually a precursor to a uh, high grade serous cancer usually of the ovary or fallopian tube and then also you can get a fallopian tube cancer where the cancer actually starts in the tube other things that i want you to remember you can also get tuber factor infertility and that usually means there's some damage or some reason the tube is blocked or scarred you can also get hydrosalping so that's usually a benign condition most patients don't have pain, but hydro means water, salpings means tube, so it's like water-filled tube. And usually that cyst or fluid building up in the tube, it can cause pain, but always. I've had some patients that had it and they didn't have any symptoms at all, but it can impact your fertility status. So those are some of the conditions of the fallopian tube that can occur. So when we think about fallopian tube cancer, it's very rare. There's about three to 400 cases per year, and the incidence is 0.14 to 1.8% of all genital tract cancers. So super rare, well, we don't see it very often, but it does happen. Usually when we're talking about fallopian tube cancer, we kind of lump it with ovarian cancer and primary peritoneal cancers because they're all treated the same. And so you may have a fallopian tube cancer and someone may say ovarian, but we treat them all the same. So sometimes we'll, you know, be, it'll be lumped together with ovarian cancer. So just keep in mind that it is a different type of cancer, but it's treated just like a primary peritoneal or ovarian cancer. And again, with ovarian cancer, it's cancer that affects the ovary. And then the primary peritoneal cancer is cancer that affects the lining of the uterus, so the primary peritoneal lining. Most fallopian tubes are high-grade serous cancers. There is a tumor marker called the CA125, and that's actually a protein that some cancers will produce. So 80% of fallopian tube and ovarian and primary peritoneal cancers will have an elevated c 125 but about 20% will have a normal tumor marker. And most patients do have symptoms. So some of the symptoms are watery vaginal discharge, 
um, colicky pelvic pain and then a pelvic or abdominal mass. And that's usually Lasko's triad. And about 50 to 60% will have those symptoms. Not everybody, but a majority. But most patients do have some type of symptoms. Usually primary fallopian tube cancer is diagnosed at the time of surgery. It's really hard to pick up before surgery. Some of the other risk factors for increasing your risk of fallopian tube cancer is having lots of ovulation. So patients that never had children, patients that breastfeed or had early age of onset when their cycle started. So if they were like seven, eight, and also patients that had a very late stopping of cycles, so menopause. So when that lifetime ovulatory uh, rate is high, so let's say you started at seven and you didn't stop till 58, that means your body, your ovaries were ovulating for a very long time. And we know that sometimes that damage caused by ovulation does put you at increased risk for these type of cancers, such as fallopian tube, ovarian, primary peritoneal cancer. Doesn't mean you'll get cancer, it just means that we know that's a risk factor and something that we keep in mind. Now we also can pick up fallopian tube cancer. Sometimes if a patient has an abnormal pap that has glandular cells that are abnormal. Now again, the pap test is not a test for ovarian cancer. It's not a test for fallopian tube cancer. But every now and then we will have some atypical glandular cells that are picked up on the pap test and that causes us to investigate further. Usually you'll get an ultrasound to look at the ovaries or tubes because sometimes those glandular cells are coming from somewhere else and not just in the uterus or cervix. So a lot of times, not often, but we can see those atypical glandular cells presenting as like a fallopian tube or ovarian cancer. Not very common. I think I've seen it once or twice, but it can happen. Now how we detect or pick up fallopian tube cancer, usually we'll do imaging such as an ultrasound, a CAT scan or a pelvic MRI. Those are ways that we detect, you know, a mass on the ovary or the fallopian tube, but typically this is not diagnosed until surgery. If you're doing this video so far, please give me a like, and if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Now we treat fallopian tube cancer again, just like ovarian cancer and just like primary peritoneal cancer. So typically you'll have surgery, usually hysterectomy followed by chemotherapy and usually we'll remove also the lymph nodes in the pelvic and around the aorta area and also the omentum. So it's kind of our standard surgery. Now that'll also depend on the extent of disease spread. So if you have very extensive disease at the time of surgery, you may get something called neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And that's chemotherapy up front to shrink the disease and then you'll have surgery later. But typically this is diagnosed at the time of surgery. But what are some of the ways you can reduce your risk for a fallopian tube cancer? Some of the ways that you can reduce it is by by reducing the amount of ovulation. So that's one good thing about the birth control pills. You don't ovulate and that's why you don't get pregnant. So I tell patients kind of the birth control pills make your ovaries kind of go to sleep. So they're not working as hard and they get some rest. Kind of a simplistic view, but a lot of patients kind of understand that visual. So birth control pills, of course, having children when you're pregnant, you're not ovulating. So of course, that reduces the number of ovulatory cycles. Another way is breastfeeding. Definitely breastfeeding as long as you can, uh, certainly over a year if you can, because we know that also reduces the number of ovulatory cycles your ovaries have to produce. And so breastfeeding all your children is very important. And I tell patients, it not only reduces your risk for ovarian or fallopian tube cancer, but also the babies are much healthier. They don't get as sick and it also reduces your risk for breast cancer. Other ways we prevent ovarian cancers or fallopian tube type cancers is surgery. So if you are someone that wants a tubal ligation for sterilization, let's say you've had all your babies, you don't want any more children, well, we used to just take a portion of the fallopian tube. Now we know if we remove the entire fallopian tube, we do reduce the risk of fallopian tube cancer and also ovarian cancer. So a lot of times removing that entire tube is one of the ways we reduce the risk of this type of cancer. And also removing the tubes and ovaries. So if you had both tubes and ovaries removed for whatever reason, we know that also reduces your risk for getting fallopian tube cancer and ovarian cancer. So remember, fallopian tube cancer is rare, only about three to 400 cases per year in the United States, but it is an important cancer that I wanna make sure you're aware of. September is ovarian cancer awareness and gynecologic cancer awareness. So I wanna make sure that you've heard of this type of cancer. And remember some of the three symptoms that are common, not everyone has these symptoms, but they're very common are the watery vaginal discharge, colicky pelvic pain, and a pelvic or abdominal mass. If you have those three symptoms, definitely see your healthcare provider. 
Well, I hope you like this video. If you haven't already, please give me a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe and please share this video with a friend, a sister, a coworker, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for watching to the very end. Bye-bye.